Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Anthony Allen. I'm our Assistant Director of Ecological Restoration here at Save the Sound. Uh, I am going to be in the background today, but wanted to give folks a uh, an overview of uh, the space and a welcome to this space. So uh, this this feels like a long shot these days, but if anyone is unfamiliar with Zoom, uh, you know you will notice in the lower left hand corner of your screen that uh, you are muted or should be muted. Um, please remain on mute for the duration of the webinar today. Um, we do that for a couple reasons, not least of which is that we are recording. Um, so unless <laughs> unless you want your face to pop in and out randomly during the recording that we post later, um, please, please remain on mute. Uh, and, uh, and we'll, we'll take questions at the end. So as we go through this and we hear from, from all the different speakers, um, as you have questions come up, please put those in chat. And I believe some of the speakers may be answering questions as we go, uh, in the chat, but certainly at the end too, there will be some time for Q and A. Uh, in just a moment here, I'm going to launch a poll to get an even better sense of who's in the room with us today and who's in the room with all of you before I kick it over to Katie and we really get started here. And here you go. This is who's in the room. So looks like we have um, a really, really good mix. A lot of interested community members or educators, uh, a lot of private landowners or public land managers. Uh, again, this was select all, so many of you are probably wearing several of these hats, um, which is fantastic. Welcome to our municipal staff and government representatives. A couple practitioners in the room, which is great. And then the interest here, lots of uh, curiosity about wet Westchester wetlands and interest in, in protecting them or restoring them. Uh, some, some folks who have wetlands on their property. Great, lots of interest in Edith Reed. Awesome. Okay, well, welcome to everybody who's in the room. And uh, I'm going to stop talking now and take it over to Katie Friedman, who is our wonderful New York Ecological Restoration Program Manager and who will be facilitating today. Take it away, Katie. Hi all, thank you so much for joining. We really appreciate it. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to all the elected officials and their staff who are joining today. Welcome to Wetlands of Westchester, the critical ecosystem in your backyard. If you're not yet familiar with See the Sound, we are an environmental nonprofit doing work in Connecticut and New York. We're leading environmental action in the Long Island Sound region, fighting climate change, saving endangered lands, protecting the sound and its rivers, and uh, our bread and butter for my team, working with nature to restore ecosystems. Our ecological restoration team has over a decade of experience in dam removal and restoring river resiliency, implementing green infrastructure such as rain gardens on a small scale and large scale uh, uh, bioswales and, and green infrastructure systems, developing watershed management plans in partnership with municipalities and communities, and physically restoring wetlands and marshes. Um, my role in particular, I am the New York Ecological Restoration Program Manager. It's nice to meet all of you. And my role is to further expand this important work, getting projects done on the ground uh, further in New York. So I'm focused on Westchester County, why we're here today, the Bronx, Queens, and the North Shore of Long Island. And I wanted to quickly mention our team can play multiple roles. At a minimum, we are able to facilitate and convene folks around either a particular project or issue. We are also able to partner directly with other community groups, directly with municipalities. Um, and then our bread and butter is really project management. So being able to identify a project and bring it through planning, design, and then implementation. So that's a brief overview of, of our work and, and what I'm seeking to do. And it's great to be able to, to chat with all of you today about coastal wetlands. So what are wetlands? These are critical ecosystems that are flooded by water, either throughout the year or at various times during, during a year cycle. There are freshwater wetlands that are flooded by freshwater. Those are typically found more inland. And then tidal wetlands along our coasts that are flooded by daily tides. 
And these are home to really unique plant communities that have adapted to these flood conditions. There are so many benefits of wetlands, um, but here are a few. Coastal wetlands in particular will protect the land behind them from storms and huge waves. So the plants in the marsh will actually slow down wave action, protecting the upland infrastructure and land. Wetlands, both freshwater and uh, tidal, are able to help uh, provide flood storage. So wetlands can absorb flood waters and hold them uh, providing flood storage and mitigating localized flooding. They're also fantastic habitat for a variety of species, um, particularly some critically threatened and endangered uh, fish and birds, and are known as nursery grounds uh, for, for young of the year uh, critters. Salt marshes also uh, you know, are full of plant, plant life, and those plants are photosynthesizing constantly and by doing so are capturing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and helping to mitigate climate change in that regard. They're also sucking up nutrients, absorbing nutrients from our water column and helping to improve our water quality. And then us as humans appreciate wetlands for all of those reasons, uh, but also for recreation, so fishing, boating, and swimming. Our wetlands are unfortunately facing a myriad of threats. Uh, I won't go into each of these, but our marshes are eroding along the coast. This is a photo of Blind Brook and Rye. Um, they're actually receiving, uh, many of them are receiving too many nutrients, which is imbalancing the system. And marshes are also threatened with increased sea level rise. So as the water rises, marshes may not be able to grow or accrete vertically um, at a fast enough rate to catch up to the rising waters. Um, and when a marsh has a hardened shoreline behind it, such as a bulkhead or a seawall, that marsh uh, is not able to migrate upland uh, as sea level rises. So that's certainly a threat. There's also um, issues with invasive species, land development, and marine debris. Um, and I wanted to highlight you know, all the benefits, all the threats associated with coastal wetlands briefly um, before turning it over to our fantastic panelists. So, uh, this is going to be an overview of a lot of resources, contacts related to wetlands uh, in Westchester. Each of these panelists could easily present for an hour or more, um, but we've asked them to do some rapid fire overview so that we can all get a taste of the great work going on in the area. So with that, I'm going to switch it over and introduce uh, Victoria O'Neill. So Vicki is the Long Island Sound Study Habitat Restoration and Stewardship Coordinator for NUIPIC at New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Vicki works with partners, like Save the Sound, to plan and implement habitat restoration and land protection projects within the Long Island Sound watershed. And with that, I will uh, hand it over to Vicki. Thanks, Katie. Okay, so today I'm going to talk to you about a really exciting project that just finished that's providing some great resources for folks in Westchester. The title of the project is Developing Conservation Plans for New York's Long Island Sound Marsh Complexes. This project was funded through Long Island Sound Study, was managed by Nui Pick, and we hired Warren Pinnacle Consulting to work on the project. It was completed in June of this year. Next slide. So the purpose of the project is to assist Long Island Sound communities and conservation groups in developing tidal marsh conservation plans focused on marsh migration and increasing coastal resiliency. Next slide. So what is marsh migration? So marshes are dynamic systems. They are not stagnant. They naturally grow uh, and shrink in elevation over time and they move in location. Um, they can do this under normal conditions. When you include sea level rise caused by climate change, um, it can cause an issue because as marshes are starting to move in higher elevation with higher sea level, as long as there's area behind them to move, um, they can adjust and marshes are kept. If there's a structure behind the marsh, let's say a seawall, a man-made structure, it can squeeze out a marsh and over time the marsh can be lost and drowned. So those are obstacles and concerns for us. Next slide. So the project itself focuses on marsh migration using a model called sea level, affecting marshes model. And the whole idea of the model is to look at sea level rise 
um, over time under various uh, sea level rise scenarios. So low, medium, high sea level rise over various time periods throughout to 2100. We completed the model for the Long Island Sound marshes. We focused on the 20 largest marsh complexes. We included those model results into a viewer that's easy to use and available to the public. Um, and in that viewer, we, on top of it, added land ownership data. So we could see how marshes migrated and moved over time under various sea level rise scenarios. Once that was completed, we presented to stakeholders and then we decided to create two marsh conservation plans, one in Westchester. Next slide. So here's the interface. Um, the link is there. We'll send that out to um, everybody on the call after today. Um, next slide. So what can you do with this viewer? Um, you can do a couple of things. So you can look at marsh habitat types. So here you can see um, different color schemes indicating different marsh habitats. Um, next slide. So you can see also on each of the marsh habitats, you can see a fact sheet for that complex on the left-hand side. On the bottom of the slide, you can see sea level rise um, scenario um, ranges that you can move around to see over time periods. And on the right-hand side, you can choose um, either to look at the marsh habitat types or the probability of marsh on top of um, a certain area of land. Next slide. So you can then on top of that put on tax parcel data. So you can again look at public versus private land um, to see what will happen on that parcel over time under your different sea level rise scenarios. Next slide. And the blue indicates uh, the public land, the black indicates the private land. Next slide. So the viewer is completed at the moment for 20 marsh complexes, but we are in phase two right now, and we hope to complete all marsh complexes within the New York Long Island Sound watershed by the end of next year. So we only had one Westchester marsh done in the viewer, but we hope to have all of the marshes done in Westchester by the end of next year. So stay tuned. So once we finished the viewer and presented to stakeholders in each of the counties in New York state, um, we then chose two sites to move forward to marsh conservation planning. One site was in Manitou Creek on the east end of Long Island. The other site was in Westchester County. We had buy-in from Westchester stakeholders. We created a planning team. Our planning team included um, individuals from many different entities, um, including NGOs, municipal officials, uh, federal and state government representation. Um, this planning team of about almost 20 people really created the plan. Uh, Warner Pinnacle and myself just helped guide it. So these uh, groups helped put the information into the plan that they wanted to see for marshes on, in Westchester. Next slide. So what is in the plan itself? So here's the five kind of main things you'll find in the plan. We'll share the plan with um, everyone on the call after this, after this meeting. Um, you're gonna see information on the marsh resources in Westchester, benefits, benefits of marshes, threats to marshes um, in Westchester, marsh conservation planning ideas, and also an appendix that includes a whole bunch of really great visuals and maps showing how marshes will change over time um, in Westchester County. Next slide. So the, the team, the planning team really, even though we only looked at one marsh complex in Westchester in the viewer product, in the planning product, um, our, our planning team really wanted to look at a few key marsh complexes for the plan. So we pulled out these marsh complexes, Blind Brook, Wetlands and Rye, Marshlands Conservancy and Rye, Otter Creek Preserve in Mamaroneck, Hen Island, Hummocks Conservation Area in Mamaroneck, and Pine Brook Wetland in Larchmont. So six sites we looked at in this plan. All right, next slide. Here they are located on a map. So you can see with some major towns in there where they are situated in Westchester. Next slide. So let's look at the different pieces of the plan. What can you see? So in the marsh resources section of the plan, you're gonna see detailed information on each of the six sites, size of the site, ownership, details about the habitat, but you're also gonna see some really interesting stuff on history of the sites. Here are three historical images from Hummocks Conservation Area, 1925, 1960, 2021. The star in the photo is just the same exact location. The angles of the photos are a little different, but the star is the same property. And you can see from 1925 to 1960, how much of the tidal wetland in that area was filled in to create recreational and housing areas for that community. Um, drastic change. The interesting part is I'll talk about in, in a little bit later is the star also is that same property is a location where a private property owner actually looked at a failing seawall on his property and decided to pull back that seawall and create a living shoreline or a nature-based shoreline to allow for marsh migration. 
And another interesting part about hummocks is that there's only about 10 and a half acres remaining in that marsh complex to date. Next slide. Okay. In the appendix related to um, the resources, you're going to find a number of different images from our model from the viewer for each of the six sites. So here's an example of what you might see in the appendix. Blind Brook, you're going to see maybe here's a, a probability map um, image where you can see the probability of marsh um, in the year 2100 comparing public versus private land. Again, so this is the possibility of that happening. Um, next slide. Here is a comics conservation area in the appendix. You can see imagery, um, again, from the model and the viewer pulled out where you're going to see um, on the left-hand side, you can see habitat type in the current condition with the different colors you see for different types of marsh. And then on the right-hand side, you can see the potential for marsh in 2100 under the highest sea level rise scenario, which is 1.9 meters. Again, this is the potential for that. But this is for each of the sites, you'll see, you'll see maps and images like this in the appendix. Next slide. So Katie talked a, um, a bit about the threats. We have some, we have a section within the planning document for Westchester that highlights many threats to marshes. So Katie covered a bunch, but in the section of sea level rise, we talk about each of the marsh complexes, the six. We talk individually how um, it is predicted the marshes will change in each of those six complexes associated with appendix images that I just showed you. We talk about development and how development can squeeze out marshes with vertical walls. We talk about water quality, how nutrients can impact marsh health, and how while marshes are great at sequestering nutrients like nitrogen, there is a tipping point. And, and after a while, if it's too much nitrogen, marshes fail and start to die. We talk about mar uh, marine debris, both large scale and microplastics. And we talk about invasive species and how they uh, can change the ecosystems and change ecosystem benefits and biodiversity in marsh and how that can be detrimental to a marsh system. Yeah, okay. And then um, the, one of the great sections here is things you can do, some marsh conservation planning. What can you do to help marshes? We talk about different strategies, managing marshes for invasive species. We have great examples in Westchester of that happening, like in, mar in Marshlands Conservation Conservancy, um, controlling them. Yeah, improving water quality inputs into marsh areas from runoff or um, improving septic system, septic systems that are failing in the area to improve water quality. Uh, we talk about land purchases and easements, how you know public and private entities can work together to actually leverage their resources and buy out land um, where you see marshes are going to migrate anyway. Um, you know, we have great entities, Westchester, like the Westchester Land Trust um, that do things like this. Local regulations, um, how, you know, local town and planning boards can consider marsh fate when they're thinking about zoning, setbacks, um, rolling easements, transfer of property development, um, you know, any type of restrictions to harden arm and shore, armoring shorelines, how this can be considered in those kind of um, regulations. Marsh restoration, great examples throughout Westchester at Echo Bay, Harbor Island Park, um, a nursing lake, but you can restore wetlands to a more healthy system. And finally, living shorelines, which we're going to hear about a little bit later. But again, here's some photos on the bottom that show that property with the, that red star that I talked about earlier of that failing seawall on private property that was pulled back to allow for a terraced, more natural marsh system of a living shoreline to, again, allow for some marsh migration. So there are possibilities out there. And of course, education and outreach to just educate the community about the options that they have um, to make their coastlines more resilient. Thanks. Wow, great, Vicki. Thank you so much. Um, that was really fantastic. And you did it in 10 minutes. Really impressive. <laughs> um, okay, wonderful. I'm now going to pass it over uh, to Heather Gerloff and Angela Scavizzi. Heather is the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation Marine Habitat Manager for Regions 3 and 4 and Manager of the Hudson River National Estuarine Research Reserve. Angela is the GEC Marine Habitat Biologist in Region 3, so take it away. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. This is Angela. I will be presenting the first half of these slides. Heather and I are going to be focusing today on helpful guidance on the permitting process, but we only have about 10 minutes, so let's get started and we're going to go to the next slide. So here's a table of permits required for shoreline work in the Marine District. The Marine District includes the shoreline of Long Island, New York City, Westchester County on the Long Island Sound side, 
and the shorelines of the Hudson River south of the Mario Cuomo Bridge, so both the Rockland County and Westchester sides. Two of the permits and authorizations on this table are from other state agencies. Today we are only talking about DEC permits in the red box, but it's important to note that when you do come in for a permit, there will be other state and federal agencies involved. So first we're gonna talk about the Article 15 protections of waters permitting. The Long Island Sound and the Hudson River are both navigable water, water bodies, so any fill and excavation below mean high water will require a permit. And next, we're gonna talk about our Article 25 Tidal Wetlands Permitting in more detail on the next slide. State regulated tidal wetlands are mapped along the entire shoreline of the Marine District. So this includes Westchester Long Island Sound and the portion of the Hudson River south of the Mario Cuomo Bridge. These wetlands include both vegetated and unvegetated areas. They are divided, divided into six categories that include vegetated areas like our high marsh or intertidal marsh and unvegetated areas like coastal shoals, bars, and flats. The image on the right is taken from the DOS's Geographic Information Gateway Mapper, and they have taken our tidal wetland maps and color-coded the different tidal wetland categories, so I thought this would be a good image to provide to viewers to see the different colors here in Milton Harbor. We also regulate what we call the adjacent area, which can extend up to 300 feet from the tidal wetland boundary. The adjacent area can be cut off by multiple factors and is very site specific. So if you need assistance determining these boundaries for a project or on your property, please feel free to contact me and I can talk to you about those um, jurisdictions because that is always the best first step to a restoration project or a shoreline project it's to determine your jurisdictional boundaries first. Next slide, please. Here I've included a list of regulated activities that are common with shoreline projects. Some of these bullets include specific language that relates back to our regulation and impacts the compatibility of each activity depending on the tidal wetland area that is impacted. So one activity in the tidal wetland high marsh might be considered presumptively incompatible but might be considered generally compatible in the adjacent area. And all of these listed here are kind of related to shoreline projects. So establishing plantings or constructing a shoreline stabilization structure. They're all listed in our implementing regulations. Next slide, please. When you are submitting an application to the department, it is very important that your application includes a written description or what we often refer to as a narrative that discusses how your proposal meets our permit issuance standards. I have condensed a list here from both our Article 15 Protection of Waters and our Article 25 uh, Tidal Wetlands Program. So that includes uh, demonstrating that your project is compatible with the policy to preserve and protect tidal wetlands, to prevent their destruction, and to not have any undue adverse impact on both the present or potential value of that affected tidal wetland area. We also look to make sure that your project is compatible with public health and welfare, reasonable, necessary, and complies with development restrictions. One problem that applicants usually have is they try to, they don't quite understand how to include this part in their application. So on the next slide, we have our Tidal Wetlands Guidance Document. The best resource we have to help guide applicants is this document. It was published in 2017, and it is designed specifically for living shoreline techniques, but is very applicable for other shoreline and restoration work. It provides guidance on how living shoreline applications can demonstrate meeting permit issuance standards, and it promotes consistent reviews within the region. So how I review in region three will be consistent with regions one and two. So not only is this document good for design professionals and property owners like yourselves on this webinar, but it's also great for state staff like myself. Next slide, please. So for example, when you're putting together an application, you might ask yourself, how do I demonstrate my proposal as reasonable and necessary? And this guidance document outlines that for you. So you could include if there's infrastructure development or habitat necessary to protect, you could assess the cause and rate of erosion on site, and you can provide an alternative analysis. Next slide. 
Another question you might have is how do I show reviewers I picked the right shoreline treatment for this area? You could look at the erosive forces, the wave characteristics, if there's a lot of boat traffic, any chance of ice, surface water runoff. You could also look at the habitat value, what types of plants and animals are present, what are the water conditions and sunlight exposures if you're proposing plantings to make sure that those plants can survive in those conditions. And you'll look at other physical shoreline information like the tidal range, sea level rise projections, shoreline slope, and another good one is to look at nor nearby shoreline stabilization efforts and their condition, assess their condition and how you can address that problem in your own design. Next slide. So, oh, sorry. So I was just gonna say, I highly recommend this document and I'm gonna hand it over to Heather. <laughs> okay, and welcome everybody. My name is Heather Gearloff and because I have two roles here at the department, my dual role comes at, <laughs> with the joy of both reviewing the applications and also preparing permit applications. So as a manager of the research reserve, we co I co-manage four intertidal marshes and those inter intertidal marshes oftentimes need a bit of restoration to keep up with their uh, function. Next slide. So Angela and I have thought that it might be beneficial to give the attendees some examples. And this first example is a residential site, which uh, we have already seen through Becky's um, presentation. At this site, the bulkhead was predating the regulations. And so when reviewing the site, we needed to apply the issuing standards, keeping in mind that what was there historically, what sections are important for the long-term integrity of the site, and the areas that are failing or have failed, and what are they really necessary for, and can they be changed to enhance the future value of the wetland? And you, here you can see this corner of the property, which is a different angle from Vicki's um, pictures. We can see how that corner was starting to fail and when we removed it, it reclaimed an area that was historically tidal wetland. Next slide. Here are a few tips on how you can balance impacts of a tidal wetland. In the top picture, you'll see an area that had a bulkhead that had failures historically. And this re the new installation removed a section of seawall and embraced the bedrock that was there on site that continues to keep that property stable. So there's a couple of other points. Um, let's go to the next slide though, because you can always go back to that. So I wanted to spend a bit more time on the Piermont project. So when I mentioned that I co-manage intertidal marshes, the southern one is Piermont Marsh, and I thought it might be valuable to use an example with um, my experience. So um, we had a restoration project at Piermont Marsh where we assessed the marsh, and you can see on the left, there was erosion, and we noticed this in ortho imagery, of about one foot per year. So we were, we were finding that the marsh was eroding one foot per year. And looking at that shoreline, we found that there was a critical location where this oxbow, you'll see on the left-hand side, was critically close to the Hudson River. If for some reason this, this oxbow breached into the Hudson, we would be um, experiencing a lot of erosion on the marsh, as well as destabilize, destabilizing a key central part of that marsh. So looking at that area as well as more assessments, we determined on the right-hand side to, to have a project that, that would minimize that erosion. You can see we've planned for two sills. And how we came upon that was looking at the erosion rates, we modeled wave action, we assessed a lot of alternatives as well as reviewed a number of different types of materials to determine what plan would work, what we felt could work best. Next slide. And so we used all that informa information to submit a robust tidal wetland permit application. But as you may already know, if you had experience with applying for permits, I still didn't make the full mark and had to come back with a bit more information. And that's mostly because we didn't really go through this the wetland, the living shoreline guidance as closely as we could have, we had to come back and resubmit more information for endangered threatened species, the sea level rise models found of the, the CARA, uh, uh, the Climate Risk and Resilience Act, 
And we also needed to address some of the minor questions on monitoring. So I'm very much aware of the complexity of permitting, and I'm, I'm using that experience to help communicate with applicants and do a better job making sure people understand the regulations and what's needed in permit applications. Next slide. And so this last slide has additional resources. The grouping of the top part are all mappers that are really useful in assessing current conditions. And also you'll find additional resources in the Community Risk and Resilience Act um, link. This is at the DEC. And here you're going to find sea level rise models as well as nature-based guidance documents that New York State has put out. And the last piece is the Coastal Management Program. And, um, Coastal Erosion Hazard Area Program is something we haven't addressed, and it it's an, adds another layer of complexity on Long Island Sound, so it's a good place to look for to get some more information about that program. And next slide. And Angela and I are here to answer questions, and certainly we can always be reached out to after with further concerns or questions about regulations and how that might need for your project. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. So much great information in 10 minutes. Um, really appreciate it. Wonderful. All right. We are going to now hand it over to our last but not least presenters. Um, and this is actually going to be focused on a specific project uh, in Rye. So I am happy to introduce Jim Murek and Megan Raymond. Jim is a senior water resources engineer and project manager at SLR with his professional engineer license in three states and is a certified floodplain manager who has been with the firm since 2005. Megan is a senior project manager in environmental science who specializes in all facets of project work, including site assessments, permitting, report writing, and project strategy. She is a professional wetland scientist, a certified floodplain manager, and a registered soil scientist. Um, thank you so much. Take it away. Great. Thank you, Katie. Um, thank you everyone else for joining and thank you for the uh, for everyone else presenting. I have a high bar, I need to make this in 10 minutes, so we'll, we'll do the best we can here. Uh, as Katie mentioned, my name is Jim Murek, I'm a water resource engineer. And um, you know, as Katie, Vicki, um, Heather and Angela, both are, are all gave a, a great intro as to why, you know, coastal wetlands and non-hardened shoreline treatments are, are so important to coastal wetlands. And uh, so we're here just to share an example of of one such living shoreline um, in Long Island Sound. Uh, next slide, please. So our project is located next to Playland Park in between Playland and Edith Reed Living um, Wildlife Sanctuary. It's on the Connecticut, New York border uh, in Long Island Sound. And um, yeah, perfect, thank you. So the project purpose, um, this segment of shoreline has undergone some significant erosion over over actually the last hundred years. It's actually a man-made shoreline from the 1920s. Um, the most recent of which some of you may remember was Hurricane Sandy um, in October 2012, but um, other storms in December of 92 eroded the shoreline as well. Um, so Westchester County responded, who, and Westchester County owns the land and responded to that, that storm by, by trying to armor the shoreline uh, to save it from further damage. Um, and that hardened system of armoring and dune creation um, were, were slowly eroded away uh, until they were completely destroyed during Hurricane Sandy. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a photo of the site as it was uh, in 2020. Um, it's actually gotten worse since then, but I just don't have a more recent photo. Uh, but you see the timber guardrail has been uh, eroding, which kind of shows the limits of where the shore used to be. Um, and you see all the damage that's being uh, caused by wind-driven storms and wave energy. Uh, next slide, please. So since hard armoring didn't work, the county's pursuing a new strategy. So we're looking at a bioengineered living shoreline to try to stabilize the shore. Uh, I won't read you know, this whole definition, but you know, the key elements are you know, a living shoreline uses native materials, it combines it with harder structures, it enhances habitat, and a living shoreline can, can add resilience and adaptability to the, to the shoreline. Um, the shorelines, living shoreline will have vegetative components. They can adapt to change lining, changing baseline conditions um, where hard infrastructure can't. And in some instances can self-repair when damaged, just like natural sites have been doing you know, for centuries. Right, next slide. 
So this project has a number of sponsors. Uh, the county is the primary sponsor, Westchester County, and has been the driving force since the beginning. Uh, we have Rob Dozier of the Westchester County Department of Planning with us today, um, but we've had lots of other NGOs and, and city, uh, the city Rai and other groups who have been interested and have lent uh, support along the way. So we continue to look forward to working with those groups as we, as we develop this project further. Uh, next slide. So I'm the project manager. Again, I work for a company called SLR Consulting. I'm located in Cheshire, Connecticut. Uh, Megan Raymond is with me here today. She's our lead coastal ecologist. She's working out of the New Haven office. And we have other, other groups throughout New England. Um, we have our permit specialists in New York and New Paltz. We have our, our two-dimensional hydrodynamic modeling group up in Waterbury, Vermont. And we have some very talented landscape architects, both in New Haven and here in Cheshire, who are helping with um, the plant selection and, and general layout. Uh, next slide, please. So as coastal consultants, you know, we're often called upon to develop solutions to protect shorelines and support infrastructure. Um, as you know, many of these protections involve stone revetments, concrete walls, steel sheet piling, or other hardened treatments designed to withstand, you know, a certain severity storm event. Um, most of you on the call have probably heard about, you know, the 100-year storm. Um, but as history has taught us, we know that there's always a, for lack of a better way to describe it, 101 year storm uh, lurking in the future, which can overtop those, that infrastructure. Um, as, we, as our climate changes, we see sea levels rising, we see higher storm severity and frequency, and more intense winds attacking our coastal environments. So as such, we expect to see increasing reports of infrastructure damage and failure. Um, this is a great chart that shows the range of shoreline stabilization techniques starting from the living shoreline and green infrastructure on the left and the harder, more um, coastal structures and more traditional engineering uh, structures on the right. Next slide, please. So for this living shoreline project, you know, we've divided the shoreline into three zones based on elevation and we've developed treatments for each zone that holistically work together to protect the shoreline. Um, next slide. The lowest zone is going to be the subtidal zone, and that's located below mean low tide. Um, so the priority here is going to be dis to dissipate wave energy before it reaches the upper shore and to help promote soil recruitment and vegetation growth uh, into the intertidal zone. Uh, next slide. So for a tidal wetland to be sustainable, we need to dissipate the wave energy. And to accomplish this, a combination of boulder sills and reef balls at this location are proposed, which both also enhance and diversify ecological habitat and the shoreline. Um, the boulders will be placed in the deeper waters where the oysters may not recruit as readily, um, but both structures break, break up a wave formation and lead to calmer waters on the landward portions of the shoreline. Next slide. Moving up the shore, we see the intertidal area located between the low and high tide lines. Uh, this area tends to be a little more dynamic uh, it's typically the subject of the majority of breaking wave action, you know, not counting tidal storm events. Next slide, please. So after lowering the, lowering the wave energy using the boulder sills and reef balls, we would look to plant low marsh, Bartina, and, and high marsh uh, patents in, in the intertidal zone. Uh, the root mass of these are going to hold and recruit, recruit growth media uh, in, in a place where only gravel and cobbles exist right now. Um, in our particular site, and I don't have the time to go into the details, but we do see evidence of this farther up the shoreline, uh, but just in, in, a, in a calmer area, but in our exact uh, project area where we know uh, there's been a lot of shoreline erosion, the energy is just too high and, and that peat recruitment hasn't been able to uh, take place. Next slide, please. So our third zone is the back shore, and this is where the shore interfaces with the upland. Um, this is the area that takes the brunt of damage from wind and storm events um, and has, you know, when we have the Hurricane Sandys uh, and the 100 year floods, um, is, taking, is taking all of that wave energy directly. Next slide. Um, so in order to complete the shoreline protection and allow for future sea level rise, we propose coastal dunes anchored by root mass of woody vegetation and coastal salt tolerant species to help hold the soils in place against erosive wind and wave forces. Uh, next slide. Putting all this together, this gives us a comprehensive living shoreline plan. Uh, this is a zoomed out rendering of the concept plan uh, that we're going to be advancing to uh, preliminary advanced design and final design. 
on going forward with permitting. Um, the City of Rise decided to make this a demonstration project for other organizations and NGOs in the region who may be interested in using bioengineering and living shoreline stabilization techniques. Um, and intends to place educational signage on the site to help spread the word uh, to the many site visitors. Next slide. And just for fun, I should say, as part of our design process, we conducted some pretty cool two-dimensional hydrodynamic wave modeling. Um, it, we were using the simulated wave in near shore swan model, which helps us predict what sorts of protection our living shoreline could offer and how it would behave during winter and storms. Uh, the results were favorable and indicate that the proposed shoreline conditions will allow for and promote uh, stable marsh development. Uh, next slide. So this is, yeah, so we're in the process of advancing the design further now and we'll be um, ready to submit our state and federal permit applications uh, shortly. Uh, we're expecting the regulatory permitting to begin uh, and, and take up to six months or more uh, and hoping for construction, which is loosely scheduled in the winter between 2022 and 2023. Uh, and that concludes everything I prepared and I just wanted to thank you all again and just open it up to questions. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Um, and again, thank you all so much for joining. Thank you to our panelists for those wonderful overviews. That was a lot of information um, in a short period of time. We have been recording this webinar and we'll send out the recording along with our contact information uh, for follow up. And I'm going to stop sharing and see we have um, about 13 minutes for some more open question and answer. Uh, so let's see. I'm going to scroll up and uh, call out some questions that may have come in. So give me one moment while I'm yeah, doing Katie, that. Oh, Katie, do you want me to do you want me to, to go ahead? And yeah, thanks, through? Anthony. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. So um, Louise had a question that uh, Angela addressed in the chat um, about, uh, you know, a seeming conflict between Noah's living shoreline definition and the New York State coastal policies uh, with regard to natural protective features. Um, Angela, did you want to say anything else about that or just what's in the chat? Yeah, Heather has some more to yeah, add. I, we, you know, there is no, the way that our law was written, it's, it's somewhat impressive, right? It was our laws were written in 1970. This idea of nature based living shorelines was never even imagined at that time. So, what we do is we utilize the way the law is written and also the guidance document to analyze and assess really what, um, to, to balance the fill with the need and the benefit. So the law isn't fluid enough to be able to update it regularly, to add all the new terminologies and these new ideas, but it is written in a way that we can balance the fill necessary to protect the future function of that wetland. Hopefully that answers that question. Great, thank you. All right, uh, there were several questions about uh, the Edith Reed project. So I may combine a couple of these uh, for you, Jim and Megan. Um, the question from Patricia about whether that section uh, of the shore will be walkable after the project, uh, noting that many people currently walk along the, the beach there or the, the area there. And then there's a question from Susan uh, asking whether the, the project includes the removal of invasive species and whether or not that did or would destabilize the, the terrain. I'll start at it and then I'll, I'll let, I guess, Megan jump in. I, I, right now, so the intent is to have sort of a comprehensive living shoreline, sort of like a section or renderings be happy to share more information after this sort of limited format. Um, but it, it really isn't set up for pedestrian access. It's not to say that it, there wouldn't be some possibility for that, but um, no, I, I don't think that's part of what the design intent would be for that. Um, and as to, I'm sorry, can you repeat the second half of that? Yeah, the, the, it was a separate question from Susan about uh, the whether invasive? the project in, yeah, includes removal of invasive species, whether that would, would or did destabilize the terrain and how you would handle that. So there is a significant amount of Phragmites there. Um, and we, we would look to treat that and to have a post-construction monitoring. 
plan. Um, and actually, the the root masses of those phragmites are holding to some extent some of the you know preventing some erosion. Um, but we are looking to to replace those invasives with native native shoreline um, vegetation that we're hoping would would hold much better than the invasives. Um, you know, Megan, sort of Megan, if you want to jump in. Sure. Hi there, Megan Raymond. Um, that's right. I mean, we have a very limited project footprint, actually. It's about 550 feet um, in length. So within our project area, we're certainly going to be addressing non-natives by re removal. Um, we have a good deal of grading or some grading proposed with the backshore berm, and that's going to take away the phragmites that's there um, outside the project. And then during the the time where that vegetation is established to be monitored to prevent um, colonization of non-native species. Um, there are a lot of native or non-native plants uh, that surround the area. Tree of Heaven is a, is a big one um, that exists to the west. Um, the, the, a full-scale eradication of that plant in addition in, in areas outside the project area is not a part of the project now, but we could see maybe that, that gets rolled into it um, later on. But essentially the project will, with the removal and replacement, will be addressing the, the, the enhancement of habitat and then concurrent uh, stabilization measures simultaneously with the project restoration plan. Anthony, if I this is Rob Dosher uh, with the county. I just wanted to chime in with the uh, the access to that area. We do know you know that's used heavily by by kayakers and and beach walkers and whatnot. So we'll we'll do our best to to ensure that that area is still accessible um, to the public at least in some form. So we're not going to eliminate access completely to that area, but we'll we'll ensure some sort of trailway or something through that area. Great, thanks, Rob. Thanks for jumping in with that. Uh, another another question. Again, this is about Edith Reed. Um, Sarah is asking whether you can discuss any post construction monitoring that will take place and anticipated maintenance costs of the project. So yeah, we're gonna develop a, a post-construction monitoring plan as we go through the regulatory process. It's, it's really gonna involve making sure the vegetation is, is still viable, uh, making sure that you know, there's no debris or anything else that's being accumulated um, and looking for invasives. Those are the, the primary three things I think we would look for. Um, and as for you know the cost, we, we haven't developed that yet, but that would be part of something that we would do before it's implemented. And one just tack to tack on that. Typically, that restoration period after, after you know post post construction lasts approximately five five years, um, but that would be stipulated by the by the state and federal permit requirements. Great, thanks, folks. All right, uh, next question comes from Steve Otis, uh, State Assemblyman Steve Otis. Thanks for joining us today, Steve. Uh, his question. Does the, does the plan for the shoreline anticipate the damage at this site from Sandy so that it'll sustain a future storm with better results? Yes, is the short answer. You know, we, we evaluated some of the winds and flood levels that were experienced during Sandy and other, you know, historic um, tropical storms. And it was part of that, that hydrodynamic modeling that I mentioned, and I just, I, in this format, I can't get into details on, but we did a pretty robust uh, analysis of the shoreline under existing conditions and what it'll look like, what the response will be based on the living shoreline implementation to find out, you know, how, how it will react. And, you know, we do predict that especially, you know, protecting and, and with all the plantings on the back shore, we should see a much more robust system here. Um, and we wouldn't expect to see the, the kinds of damage we've seen in the past. Thanks, Jim. All right, we may may make this our last question, but if anyone else has a burning question, feel free to put it in chat. Uh, this is from Catherine in Larchmont. How does an area, and maybe I'll throw this to, to you, Rob, actually, as our, our county representative on, on the line. How does an area get attention from the county that it needs protection? I'm worried about the premium river, river tidal area just south of Larchmont. Uh, as we've heard, the developers are looking at it. Well, I mean, the, I'll actually punt this to, to Peter McCart maybe too, but I just wanted to just say that we were doing the Living Shoreline Project at Reed and Playland because it's county-owned property. So it's, um, you know, it's in our, in, you know, we own it, so it's a 
kind of low-hanging fruit, and it also comes up as a very prime area for a living shoreline and artificial reef uh, project. But um, as far as addressing uh, projects or sites that are not county-owned, um, I don't know, Peter, do you just uh, any, yeah, any that, thoughts on that? Uh, we could certainly always give our, um, you know, guidance and, um, you know, uh, a steerage on that, but, um, you know, we don't have purview over many of those properties, of course, you know, that's just not our domain. So, uh, um, yeah, sorry to hunt that a little bit, but we, we're always here to give our expertise and knowledge and, and, and guidance when we can. And thank you so much. I'll, I'll add to that. Um, you know, my role at Save the Sound is certainly keeping an eye out for potential pro restoration projects. And um, we work both with uh, municipal folks, the county, but also with private property owners. Um, so you're welcome to share information with myself and, and our team. And the, and the, you know, the county obviously owns a lot of shoreline property. So that's, you know, we're, we're busy with that alone and um, doing what we can there. And, and, you know, obviously that's more public access than uh, some of the other uh, private shoreline uh, properties. Great. Thanks everyone. And uh, I'll close maybe, maybe with this from Simon. Um, it says from, from his perspective, representing a New York state association, He'd be interested in who would be interested in creating a Congress on coastal communities to address all these issues and focus in on all the coastlines in New York State subject to sea rise. So going beyond Westchester County here, but looking at uh, working across across boundaries. Uh, I don't know if any anyone has thoughts on that. I can pipe in and say, count me in, Simon. Um, and I know we also. Uh, are going to be collaborating with Riverkeeper. I, I believe uh, George Jackman was, was on the line at some point um, on, on the shoreline and living shorelines in general. And we also have folks on the line who are new to New York Sea Grant and they're serving as sustainable and resilient community extension professionals. So needless to say, there's a lot of folks who I'm sure would be interested in that. And if anyone else wants to chime in, I'll leave the floor open before we close. Great. Well, thank you all so much. This has been um, so informative. Again, this was rapid fire, lots of information, um, but I hope that it's given you a sense of so many resources out there, contacts for all this different work. Um, and I know the panelists are happy to have you follow up with them individually with any additional questions afterwards. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. We're really pleased to be able to do this work in Westchester County and look forward to collaborating with you all.